Okay, so I think we'll make a start because we have lots to pack into this hour and a half session. I know we'll have more people joining us over the next few minutes um, and also we'll have people who will be catching up with this um, online after the live session. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. So first of all, welcome everyone to this interactive session on Everyday Technology First, which is part of History Day 2022 from Senate House Library, the Institute of Historical Research Library and the Being Human Festival. I'm Catherine Clark. I'm a professor at the Institute of Historical Research and I'm director of our Centre for the History of People, Place and Community. So this is going to be a really informal uh, participatory session in which we'll discover all kinds of fantastic collections and projects around the theme of everyday technology firsts. We're going to hear some, from some brilliant speakers. Um, we're going to have some discussion and also the opportunity for everyone to ask questions and share their own stories and content. First of all, as always, a little bit of housekeeping. So we're going to ask um, all the audience that you keep your microphones off when you're not speaking and the same for speakers doing the lightning presentations too just to avoid any interference if you can keep your camera on if you have the bandwidth to do that and if you're comfortable that's um, fantastic it's nice to see faces in the room and it's a participatory session um, do be aware that we are recording that, this session so be aware of that if you choose to appear on camera or to speak on camera at any point today I'll tell you a bit more about the ways you can join in in the session in a moment. So what do we mean by everyday technology firsts? Well, we're thinking about the experience of science and technology in our everyday, our ordinary lives. How has technological innovation transformed our own experiences? How has new technology shaped or been prompted by social change? To get us started, we already have a fantastic collection of sources and stories on our special Everyday Technology First Padlet. You can see um, the link here. Perhaps one of my colleagues could drop the link into the chat as well so that people can click on that easily. It's full of wonderful finds from archives and collections. Thank you, Gemma. It's been fantastic seeing the Padlet expand before our very eyes today as people have added more content. Um, there are individuals' own stories and memories too about the impact of new technologies on their life. Um, for example, I shared a photo of my sister, you can see it right here, um, playing on our first BBC microcomputer at home in the 1980s, happy memories. So we would love it if you could share your pictures, stories and archival treasures on the Padlet during the session. And we'd also love your personal stories and memories too. And I've got a feeling that Helen's presentation on the Ladybird books might trigger a few recollections that people will be keen to share. Actually, I think in quite a few of our presentations that's going to happen. You can also share your content and your stories on Twitter using the hashtag techfirsts and hisday22. When the time comes, there are going to be two different ways to ask a question um, or share your contribution. You can either ask or speak by typing into the chat. You can open the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom window. We suggest you leave that open through the session to stay in touch with conversation. Or you can raise your hand using the Zoom, Zoom function to ask on camera and we'll involve as many people as we can. We're going to pick out some highlights from the Padlet in a little while. Um, this is what it was looking like um, first thing this morning. Actually, I think it's grown and it's evolved since then. But before we move on to the Padlet, um, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panel of guest speakers that we have with us for today. Each of our speakers has the immense challenge of speaking for just five minutes um, on everyday technology first in their project archival collection. These are all wonderful speakers and projects. You could talk to us for hours, um, but they're going to give us a lightning talk. We're going to hear from them, then we'll open out into some discussion. I'm going to introduce each speaker in turn as they present. And just to let you know, we've got a couple of speakers who have squeezed this in in the midst of a very busy day and might be dashing off just before the end of the, of the session. So just be aware of that. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce our first speaker in the session, Eve Colpus. Eve is a historian at the University of Southampton and she leads the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project Children and Young People's Telephone Use and Telephone Cultures in Britain circa 1984 to 1999, also known by its shorter title, which is very cool, Telephonic Youth. 
You can find Telephonic Youth on their website, www.telephonicyouth.co.uk and on Twitter at Telephonic Youth. And I'm going to hand over to you now, Eve. Thank you. I know we need to switch over screen share, so I'll give you a moment to do that. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can see those slides. Fantastic. Um, so it's my pleasure to join this panel um, this afternoon and talk a bit about the project Telephonic Youth. With Dr. Aaron Andrews, I've been running this project since 2021, and we're researching why and how um, children and young people used telephones uh, in the 1980s and 1990s as technology shifted, um, in what spaces they did so, and what has connected phone use to young people's senses of identity. And I feel very privileged that I get to ask people about their Fisher-Price uh, chatter phone memories as part of this work. So we're using um, archival research, oral history research, and community history research to develop a new set of resources about young people's telephony. And our community history research has included building a digital map on our project uh, website of childhood phone memories, um, and also in-person activities with, um, with family groups. Now, partly because ours is a history of children and young people, the idea of the first has come up quite often. So I'm going to share briefly three examples of first phone stories from our research and three themes that I think these might be linked to. So the first, uh, first phone story, it's actually two stories, um, were shared on our digital map, which you can see on this slide. Um, the, the red phone icons represent where people have submitted memories. Um, and if you haven't submitted one already, um, please do add your own memory. We're, we're constantly growing the map. Um, so two memories stand out in talking about first getting a cordless family phone. Um, and they really link to a theme that I think this shows about the sort of emotional responses of people and young people to new technological developments. One contributor remembered the excitement of the day the family went cordless um, in one of their memories shared. And another contributor talked about their nan getting a cordless phone before they did and really sort of thinking this was very cool. So um, in both cases, the recollections of the excitement and the exuberance felt as young people, um, this sense of a new device and new possibilities really came through. So I think there's a theme here of the emotional responses of, of sort of first tech experiences that is really interesting. We've also been doing oral history interviews, as I've said, and my second example um, is a short clip that I'm going to play in a moment from one of these interviews, which I think shows something of a second theme that I'd like to mention, which is the idea of the power of the object. So in this clip, uh, the interviewee talks about their first mobile phone which they got in year six, um, which is the, the top year in, in primary school in the UK. So you're gonna hear my, um, my brief voice um, first in a moment, but it's the second voice to really listen to in this clip. So round about when would that have been date-wise? Uh, date-wise, that would have been uh, 1998, 1999. So it's a Nokia 33010 or 3310. Um, and it was it was very fancy at the time um and it was sort of that big i still got it in a box somewhere it was that big it had like it was nokia so it had like a um the original case was like blue and it had a uh, silver sort of hoof yeah or like a horseshoe set shape um and yeah obviously it was all uh, buttons that you press in rather than a touch screen I have to stop it because I don't have time to play much more. But I think the detailed description the interviewee gave there of their first mobile phone really shows us something of the impression that this object made on them as a young person. So, you know, the detailed description of what it looked like, the description of how you use it. And then also, you know, this, this sense that this phone was, was really fancy, was really quite fancy at the time, I think also tells us something about the power this object had as a sort of a fashionable object um, at this time for, for a young person. So, so this is my second, my second theme. 
The third theme, um, just to share one final example, I want to think about, lastly, a different type of first tech experience of some of the children who've taken part in um, activities on our project. And this really links to a final theme I've been thinking about, the relationship between um, a new technology and experiencing a new technology and, and ideas about the passage of time. And um, so at our public engagement events, we've set up stalls very much like, like the photo you see on this slide um, with disassembled old telephones, which have been a kind of prompt to people in family groups talking about their memories of phone use. Um, and for some children, this seems to have been the first time they've come into contact with an old telephone technology. And I just wanted to give one example here of a child's response. So um, picking up the receiver of this, um, the handset of this green rotary dial phone um, at Science and Engineering Day at the University of Southampton earlier this year, one child said to their parents, is this what you use back when there were dinosaurs? And th there's definitely a sense of playfulness here, of course, in, in the kind of child's response, and not all children responded in this way. But I found this really interesting, and I think it points to something quite telling about how a first tech experience, in this case of an old technology, might play into children's and adults' perceptions of the passage of time. So if I've got time to say three last sentences, um, these are my, my three final thoughts I've had in reflecting on the examples I've shared today that might connect to, to some other things we'll think about and discuss this afternoon. Firstly, I've been thinking about what is the role of memory in everyday technology first experiences. Secondly, in terms of the type of materials we've been collecting on our project, I've been thinking about who we have managed to reach in our project, who has actually shared memories, perhaps who hasn't so far. And then thirdly, um, what is distinctive about a tech first experience during childhood? And I'm going to leave it there. That's fantastic, Eve. Thank you so much. I love that you've opened up some areas that I'm sure we'll be coming back to in our discussion around you know, emotional responses to technology first, the power of the object. And I really like the way you, you thought about those first experiences in a slightly different way, first experiences of old or obsolete technologies, which you might come back to um, as well. I'm sure what Eve has had to say has prompted lots of memories for other people. It definitely has for me. So please do add those into our Padlet if you feel inspired. And as Eve said, make Make sure you make your way to the telephonic youth project and pin them to the map there as well thank you so much eve so i'm now going to introduce our second speaker it's my great pleasure to introduce david geiringer who is a social and cultural historian of modern britain with a particular interest in the histories of sexuality religion gender and emotions. He's based at Queen Mary University of London. He's published on Catholicism and sexuality, participatory oral history methods, the history of the home computer and anti-racism in the intercity. And I think, David, it's the history of the home computer that we're going to be zeroing in on now. So over to you, David. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, um, Catherine. And hi, everyone. I'm just going to share screen. I've got some slides, but as I was saying before, I've got slide envy of Eve and I think everyone else, they're much less jazzy um, than Eve's. Is that, can everybody see that there? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, you might. Yeah. Great, lovely. Um, okay, so uh, between 1991 and 2004, uh, the anthropological organization, the Mass Observation Project, periodically asked its observers, kind of a self-selected panel of, of respondents, um, to about the impact of information technology of reading, writing, communication in their everyday lives. Um, in 2004, an observer um, wrote that, uh, I confess uh, that sometimes I resort to using the computer, using cut and paste techniques to write several letters at once. Um, so confess is a strong emotional word. It evokes feelings of guilt, remorse, secrecy, uh, even mischief. Um, its use indicates that not only did the advent of the personal computer bring about a shift in the way people uh, composed their written communications, but also changed how people felt about acts of personal expression. Um, so my research with a colleague uh, who's at Sussex with me, Dr. James Baker, explored how people made sense of these changes in their everyday lives. And so it's quite commonplace for technological events and trajectories to dominate histories of computing. Um, so I'll touch very briefly on some of these in a second. Um, but the beauty of the Mass Observation Project Archive, um, which unfortunately I don't have much time to talk about here, but obviously I can 
happily answer some questions about in a second. Um, the beauty of this archive is it allows us to get beyond these kind of technocentric stories. It enables us to uncover how humans experienced and interacted with these technologies. So I think there's kind of a real synergy between what we were doing, I think what Eve's trying to do with, um, with, with telephones as well. Um, so there are a number of significant changes in the history of personal computers in late modern Britain. Um, so in 1980s Britain, the microcomputer moved from the hobby shop to the high street, um, legitimizing, according to historian Tom Lee, the idea of computers as consumer appliances. Um, so in line with the observation popularly known as Moore's Law, uh, computing tech simultaneously doubled in power uh, and fell considerably in price. So personal computers that were expensive and few in 1991 were cheap and many by 2004. Um, <laughs> uh, at the same time, um, two Microsoft computing operating systems, the first Windows 3.0 uh, and second Windows 9.5, which are probably triggering some nostalgia for some of you out there, uh, as well as myself, and contributed to the consolidation of interfaces uh, with personal computers around WIMP, WIMP-like graphic interfaces. So we can see here the image of the interface that still really remains as the basis of Windows operating system today. And um, so with this, the home computer looked and felt identical to the office computer. Um, essentially, home computers blurred the lines between home and work in a manner which both anticipated, but also, I think, facilitated the merging of the personal and professional, uh, which so many of us experienced in lockdown, uh, and indeed typifies our interaction with this very event today. So what did we find for in the archive? Well, um, I mean, one of the main benefits of people's first computers was it helped people um, write text in more easily and more quickly. So one respondent wrote, I'd love to own a word processor, a simple PC as is owned by one of my daughters would be splendid. I think my husband would enjoy using it as a computer, so maybe one day my dream will come true. It would be splendid to reproduce all the writing I wanted to with such ease. So again, beginning to hint at kind of the gender dynamics of um, how personal computers were experienced. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second um, in, in, with a later quote. Um, but beyond, but often the benefits went beyond simply creating neater and quicker text. Computers were seen to facilitate a significant change in the way people composed and communicated their thoughts. Um, so we consider this response. Um, there's a spell check on this machine. Also, my mind works faster than my hand and I miss out letters. This machine picks up on my faults and corrects them. Thank you, computer. So spell check has enabled writers to produce text at a speed that was believed to be more in line with their quote unquote natural thought processes. So computers were heralded as enabling a more efficient and intuitive process of turning thoughts into words. Um, but the introduction of personal computers also raised new questions about authenticity, authorship, and etiquette around what the personal was. So, for example, in 2004, um, when Mass Observation asked its respondents about how they wrote emails and letters, many voiced concerns about the impersonal nature of computer generated text. Um, so, some explained that they wrote personal letters by hand and professional letter correspondences on a computer to kind of maintain some kind of distinction. So one former school teacher remained committed to the computer for both personal and professional writing tasks, but made use of Microsoft Word's font options to maintain the appropriate aesthetics. So for business letters, I prefer normal black aerial font, 10, 11 or 12 point, uh, which is what I'm using now in this response. For personal letters, I use simulated handwriting in a form of uh, black or bright blue monotype Corsica 18 point. So this indicates how respondents took active efforts to preserve clear visual signifiers of the personal nature of correspondences. Um, but they also expressed kind of underlying anxieties about the act of simulation. So a number spoke of using template letters for, for example, Christmas letters or things like this. Um, but there were some kind of tensions and issues, almost quasi ethical concerns with this. You know, one said, you know, however, I cheat with them as they are usually all of a similar nature. Using a computer, it's easy to duplicate a standard letter and just add a few personal details to make each letter slightly different. So the words cheat and duplicate suggest a lingering sense of almost guilt, um, much like the response from 1991 that we opened with talking of kind of confessing to using uh, copy and paste. So there was almost an ethical dimension here. The idea that the authenticity of a text was determined as much by the processes through which it was created as by its content. 
Um, finally, if I've got a second, our research also looked at the way the introduction of the personal computer changed the dynamics of the home. Um, and particularly, it, it brought up certain questions for the gendered relationship between uh, different um, home inhabitants. So consider this response. Um, word processor, we haven't got one. It would be useful, I feel, but my husband uh, is not enthusiastic about buying one. I would also like a computer, but he says, where would you put it? I think he doesn't want the challenge of one being around. So here we find that the personal computer is both a challenge, not only to male authority, you know, the husband's ability or otherwise to master a computer is linked to his masculinity, uh, but also the husband's idea of what the home is, you know, where would you put it? Both gives authority for home organization to the female respondent, but also overrules that authority, the suggestion there is nowhere in the home for the computer. So our research began to start to slightly unpick some of the way um, the home computer made and unmade new ideas of home. Um, so to conclude, our research suggested the introduction of the computer uh, prompted new questions for three aspects of people's lives, um, for the way they express themselves uh, and through this forged uh, sense of self, for the way they compartmentalized home and work, uh, and finally, for the often highly gendered ways people made and unmade their homes. Um, the internet and its popularization in the 90s is often seen as the key historical development of our supposedly digital age. Um, our research attempts to you know, kind of resituate the humble computer in this story uh, and kind of argue maybe it has its own historical periodization. Oh, David, thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, as, as you're, you're highlighting those kind of um, questions around kind of space or negotiating the boundaries between the professional and the personal or the, the home space and the office space. So interesting. I was also really struck by what your 52 year old florist had to say about spell check, where she ended up saying, thank you, computer. And it just really encapsulated for me that the way that often we feel we're in a bit of an emotional relationship with our computers. Don't we? Often, in my case, a bit love hate you know, but quite a fraught and laden emotional relationship. I know some of you will recognise that. Thank you so much. Loads we'll come back to. We're now going to move to our third speaker. And I had to warn her earlier that I had to be really careful not to fangirl too much because <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the work of, of Helen Day and of Ladybird books. So many of you will know um, Helen. She has been researching and collecting Ladybird books for over 20 years. She is, she is curator of the wonderful world of the Ladybird artists. She's also written about Ladybird books for national newspapers, Royal Mail, the BBC, and she's made numerous radio and TV appearances. She shares her fascination with Ladybird artwork and artists on popular social media accounts. If you don't follow those already, then please do. So Helen, I will pass over to you. I think you need to set up your screen share as well. So I'll give you a moment to do that. Are we there? Fantastic. We just need to the switch to presentation view. Perfect. Um, yeah. you. Lovely. Yeah, well, hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who are too young to know, I'm going to be speaking about Ladybird Books, which were something of a publishing phenomenon in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and they make a completely unique record of the times, because although they were for all age groups, actually, they uh, were predominantly picture books. So you have an amazing and sort of unresearched, I think, uh, record of how society was perceived, distilled down as for children, but also illustrated in bright colour, careful detail, um, and how that current then changed over the decades, because the company then closed down its factories in 1999. So I'm going to give you a five minute tour of that current. What was the changes in the responses to everyday technology over those years? And we're gonna start in the 1940s, 1950s, when Ladybird books, the technology in them was absolutely minimal. The, the only, te the, the favorite technology was definitely the steam train, which featured at every opportunity, but, being technology that um, had already been around for a hundred years, it, it added to this quality of the rural, the domestic, uh, the safe. Yes, Ladybird at this time was very much for younger children, but I think there was also a dynamic of uh, the sort of immediate post-war response of commissioners, writers, editors who'd experienced the war, projecting a Britain which is in fact unaffected, unchanged, 
sunlit uplands, if you like. This changed very much in the 1960s when a new commissioning editor was um, appointed who was all Festival of Britain, push forward modern technology. Wow, the future is bright. The future is science. The future is technology. The, te the um, titles that came out were breathless with, with enthusiasm for the potential of technology and the commissioning editor was uh, in fact a socialist and very keen that technology should be seen as a way of leveling and creating a more equal society where transport, travel, um, and opportunity are not just for the rich. Uh, roads are a very good example of that. Roads were a good thing. Roads were created opportunities to build them, but then they made travel more obtainable and accessible for all people. Um, and this picture always strikes me that, you know, it, people are going to think it's a, an illustration of the trip hazards in the home. In fact, it's an exuberant take on all the wonderful labour saving devices that the average home will now have, including, if you see in the corner, a lovely old telephone, uh, uh, the, the bar electric fire, your hoover, your electric sewing machine, iron and so on. It's glowing. And of course, if electricity is going to bring all these benefits, then pylons themselves, which are carrying electricity to every home in the country, must therefore be beautiful. Graceful steel pylons, the text tells us, stretch across the fields, taking electricity to towns and villages. And of course, the telephone. So I love the look here, as you can see them looking forward to the, uh, the uh, uh, touch screen and the iPhone. And of course, the computer. Now, Lady Bird was very quick to, um, to write about computers as everyday technology. This book came out in 1971. And here we have an illustration of a small digital computer designed for the businessman. There you go, a bit of gender, a bit of uh, social history here. Um, this book was uh, very successful and I remember it being used as undergraduate reading in universities. And the Ministry of Defense was so unhappy with the basic training that uh, staff were coming into with regard to computer use that they commissioned Ladybird to print copies of this very book um, with plain covers so that the Ministry of Defence staff wouldn't be embarrassed about reading the Ladybird books. But uh, I thought the first line of the book is something that uh, draws on things that a couple of speakers have mentioned today. The very first line says there's something about computers that is both fascinating and alarming. As we move from the 1971 into the 1970s, there's very much, as world events, you know, missile crises, power cuts, oil shortages, there's such a dramatic change in tone. Suddenly all the negatives of every technology, everyday technology are being put forward. And the, it, this is the point at which the commissioning editor of Ladybird retires. And before he went, he really wanted to make it clear his anxiety about the, the direction of travel with regard to technology. So he actually wrote a book himself called What on Earth Are We Doing? And in it, he wanted to make the danger of wanting possessions and by wanting our possessions to destroy the planet. Finally, I'll leave, um, leave you with a picture of the um, picture that scarred a generation of my generation anyway, from the book Arms and Armour, uh, as it looked forward to sort of post-apocalyptic, you know, the, the disaster of nuclear war. So I hope that gives you an insight into the arc of change from the pastoral idyll of the 1940s projected through Ladybird books down to the insecurity and anxiety of the 1970s. That's absolutely wonderful, Helen. Thank you so much. What a joy, what a treat um, seeing that and that that 
really nuanced tracing of the kind of optimism and, and aspiration around technology through to the the kind of the more troubled or anxious kind of representations of technology um, later on. I learned to read with Peter and Jane, and I remember having on 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 our bookshelf a mix of the two different time two different editions of Peter and Jane and there's quite a nice reflection there as well isn't there of the kind of changing technologies between early Peter and Jane and later or oh, so much to talk about um thank you so much we'll come back to to much of that I hope um so now I'll introduce um, our final speaker before we move on into some discussion. Um, and last but not least, we have Louis Platman, who is curator at the Museum of the Home. Louis curated many of the new galleries at the museum, including Domestic Game Changers, which examines the profound and surprising ways technologies have changed our home life over the past 400 years. So absolutely bang on for what we're thinking about today. Louis is currently working on the creation of new period room displays at the museum. Thank you so much for speaking, um, Louis, and I'll hand over to you now. Great, thank you so much. Um, I will share my screen. That's all good. Cool. Um, oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm using a, a web browser, so. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I am curator at Museum of the Home in, in Hoxton uh, in London. Uh, some of you may remember it as, as the Jeffrey Museum. Um, and uh, the Museum of the Home looks at home in, in the broadest sense of the word, really. Um, and we have uh, new, brand new galleries called the Home Galleries, which examine different themes around home. And we also have uh, those period room displays that Catherine mentioned uh, that uh, track the development of the main living space in the home from uh, the 1600s to modern day. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a couple of objects which uh, kind of span that, that, that time span um, and uh, yeah, have had some surprising uh, impacts on, on, on our domestic lives. Uh, so the first object is this uh, rather odd looking um, object on, on the left, um, and you can also see it uh, in the middle of the, of the black and white picture there. Um, it's, uh, with, it's a wooden water pipe, um, probably uh, from the 17th century. Um, and these pipes uh, were used to, there was, there was a huge network of, of wooden water pipes that we used to connect uh, water from the, the new river, uh, which was a, a canal, a purpose built canal uh, to bring fresh uh, water into the homes of uh, very wealthy Londoners um, in the 1600s. So obviously, at this time, London was uh, dirty, cramped, disease ridden. Um, and a man called uh, Sir Hugh Middleton uh, saw that, saw this misery as a perfect business opportunity. Um, and so uh, for a quite high subscription fee, you could have a, a lead pipe coming from one of these uh, one of these wooden pipes that would deliver water into your home uh, for between six to 24 hours a week. Um, so the, the, the water supply was was still very limited. Um, but this was uh, oh, and here's a picture of the lovely new river, which uh, still exists today, and as I would recommend as a as a lovely walk um, in in warmer in warmer weather. Um, so uh, these these wooden the, these pipes um, would bring cleaner water from the countryside. Uh, this the canal was uh, thirty miles long. Um, and this was a, a huge upgrade on the, the, the options that people had before. Um, and obviously the London's rivers were uh, horrendously polluted. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you'd have to get your water from, uh, from pumps and wells and or even uh, water cobs, people selling water in the street. Um, and having water going directly into a cistern in your home uh, reduced uh, the, the amount of labor. It also allowed for innovations uh, like the water closet, um, which uh, in uh, into the, the, the late 1700s, we start to see uh, mi middle-class London homes with even with multiple water closets per home. Um, so this was really uh, enabling huge changes in our, in our personal hygiene. Um, and 
we, uh, this is a picture of the museum, by the way, we are in these lovely 18th century arms houses um, and uh, they, they were built for retired ironmongers. Uh, and they actually had a pump from, from the New River. So that, that would have been a huge luxury for, for people of this class at the time. Um, and I think uh, something, something that I, I like to use to illustrate how, uh, how important, how uh, valuable this water was is that the, the, the pump was padlocked uh, for fear that the, the pensioners would uh, take the water and, and steal the water and sell it at Hoxton Market. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that, that gives you an idea of um, how sought after uh, this water was. Um, and I think I'm talking very slowly, so I'm going to, uh, I've got uh, one more object to talk about or kind of theme. So uh, I wanted to talk about flat pack furniture. Uh, on, on your left, you see a, a, a Lupton Morton campus day bed. Um, which uh, that range was subs and Lupton Morton, the company was subsequently bought by Habitat and was uh, was hugely popular um, in in the mid sixties. Um, so this is a this is quite an early example of flat pack furniture, and um, I think uh, of course this it, it changed uh, how we decorate our homes, um, how we furnished our homes um, in a huge way, but it, it was also uh, indicative of other, other changes in society and the sort of um, growing impermanence in, in our home lives. Um, but what I also love about uh, this object in our collection is we have the instructions and of course the Allen keys. And uh, it's nice, <laughs> nice to know that uh, pretty much nothing has changed in, in 50 plus years of uh, flat pack furniture. Um, and in Domestic Game Changers, you will find uh, a Billy bookcase, which is thought to be the best-selling piece of furniture of all time. Um, and I've got one, uh, well, the rather crowded one behind me as well. Uh, but this is low quality furniture that is kind of designed to, to be disposable. Um, to, so if you're unlikely to, to move with it. Um, and uh, I think um, the, 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 there are growing concerns over, over sustainability, of course. Um, but with, uh, with the cost of living crisis at the moment, uh, I think this, this style of furniture is still going to dominate rather than those uh, quali high quality pieces of furniture that you see as investments and, and even heirlooms. Um, yes, so uh, that is uh, my two objects. Um, and I will hand back to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Louis. I love the way you gave us such a a wide chronological range there from you know a 17th century wooden water pipe through to ikea flat pack furniture the picture of the allen keys was slightly triggering for me i'm sure for many people in the virtual room um i think it's interesting that your choice of the wooden water pipe um intersects with quite a lot of the um, items that are shared in the padlet are to do with sanitation and health so there's a definite kind of theme there definite kind of cluster um, of objects and stories that are being shared there so thank you first of all um for their initial presentations to all of our speakers who've opened up so many kind of questions um, and themes whetted our appetites in terms of their own projects and archives and collections. First of all, this is just a reminder to everyone in the room that we are going to open out in a moment for your questions and your comments. And also, if you'd like for you to share your own everyday technology first story, either bringing to our attention something you've shared on the Padlet or something you'd like to, to speak about in the room here or anything you'd just like to drop into the chat. So please um, feel free to do that. Um, and um, First of all, I'm going to kind of we're going to begin with some questions and some discussion um, in the panel. We're also going to reach out to the Padlet as well in a minute. There are I've got loads of questions I want to ask to the panel as a result of your presentations. Um, I'm aware that um, some of you have to leave, so I want to try and front load questions that I think you will you will want to speak to. So I'm going to start with a bit of a topsy turvy question that came out of Eve's presentation. So this isn't where I thought I would be beginning our questions at all. I want to begin with the the question she raised about first encounters with old technologies or obsolete technologies um, and I'm really interested in so for example you know Helen um, in the Ladybird books in your exhibitions um, you know what do you hear about people's you know what kind of responses do people share to the depictions of, 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 of out of date or older or obsolete technologies there um, Louis that must be something that you you engage with all the time in terms of people's experiences in the Museum of the Home um, David 
I'm sure, you know, as you engage people with the history of the of the computer, you kind of you get those kind of responses as well. And Eve, you've touched on that a bit briefly already. So I wondered if we could start with any further reflections um, on that. And Eve suggested that that's a way of uh, particularly young people to kind of reflect on and articulate passing of time and sometimes do that quite playfully. Um, but yeah, thinking about old, um, obsolete, outdated, outmoded, surpassed technologies. Anyone got any thoughts on that? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, similar to uh, to Eve's experiences with um, uh, showing children kind of rotary dial phone, we we have an interactive one set up in our domestic game changers gallery, um, and it is fascinating uh, watching uh, anyone kind of twenty and under uh, in, interacting with it and discovering. Some some people don't even have a clue of, of what it is, um, and I think that could also be quite, that could also be quite difficult as a as a curator. In we we assume that everyone will have a, a, a basic understanding of of these objects, um, but with with technologies like uh, we have a a, a VCR um, in one of our galleries, and uh, uh, yeah, anyone. <laughs> Probably uh, 25 years and, and younger may may have never used one, may have may wow. never even come come across one. Um, and it just uh, passes out of lived experience and knowledge so quickly now, doesn't it? I think it's, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it it really, it really does. Um, but I think what what's great to see um, with those sorts of objects in our galleries is sort of inter intergenerational learning, um, and they it, they really provoke conversation. You'll see grandparents with with their adult kids and their, their grandchildren, and they're all uh, passing down stories um, about how these technologies uh, change their lives. Oh, that is lovely. I'd love to bring in Helen on exactly that, actually, because I know that certainly in our house, Ladybird books have been read and reread through, you know, several generations already, and the exhibitions that you curate. So do you see these kind of intergenerational conversations emerging where people are kind of, you, know, you have an older generation kind of explaining depictions of techno technology to the younger generation? Do you see the reactions of young people to those older technologies can you tell us a bit about that yeah well I think there's so much that's attached to going to see a ladybird exhibition would be driven by nostalgia so the very much the impetus is going to be from the people who themselves used it but I think ladybird books were technologically advanced in the sense that they were very robust and that had the effect that they lasted and it meant that schools didn't clear them out of the shelf or out of the shelves you know and get new ones in they lasted beyond their time. So very often people will be reading Ladybird books, which are generations out of the, the era that they were written for, and which really came back to slap them in the face, I think, in the sort of 1980s, particularly late 70s, 80s, when Ladybird very much fell out of fashion and they were being criticized often for being so old fashioned, um, often quite unjustly in that the books that were being read were, were not written for the audience that was reading them. That's really um, interesting. I think the, the, it's actually the process of producing a Ladybird book is one of the things that catches visitors' eyes at the exhibition. So before the digital age, you know, the the the, the cut and the sellotape sort of pasting lettering on and uh, and uh, the, the the fine art of printing to get an ac accurate, faithful reproduction from the original artwork to the book. I think all that strikes those people so minded. Wow, there's something really interesting there, Helen, that I don't I don't think I can quite reach towards um, uh, right right now. But you're saying something really interesting to do with the the, the kind of different pace of change in technology um, unfolding and representation of the contemporary world and kind of these documentary sources and, and texts, which is which is so interesting. The it's, kind of it's often speeded there. up, I think, and you can see that when I might be on Twitter and I'll show a picture from say the 1970s. And I'll put the date of it and people will say, oh, no, no, it's not from the 1970s. It can't be that that uh, that that furniture, um, that furniture was popular in the 1950s. And I, <laughs> that was my home. You know, we didn't chuck stuff out. The, yeah, the furniture yeah. my parents still have is the furniture I grew up with. So I think that yeah. whole approach to artifacts and their durability uh, is something we've lost a bit. You know, yeah. we've, we've lost our sense of time with a bit. 
I do wonder whether a lot of TV is to blame with that as well, that if we see something set in the 80s, everything in the room that we see, I mean, Louis, you'll know all about this, but everything is kind of peak 80s, whereas most of us were still living in very kind of early 70s worlds, probably in the 80s. Louis, did you want to comment? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is um, this is something that uh, we're looking into a lot at the museum, because at the moment, uh, the, the period rooms are very much ev everything in, say, uh, the the... 1790s room is made within uh, a 20 year period of of that date whereas uh, I yeah I don't know I don't know of anyone's home that has all uh, entirely period appropriate uh, decor so mm -hmm. um, when when we're going to when we're looking to, to redo the rooms we we want to introduce this this mixture of old and new that's fantastic thank you Eve and David do you want to come in on this question of um, well, there's lots, isn't there? We've got a bundle of things, and older technologies or kind of changing te technology. Eve, you look like you're ready to jump in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these intergenerational conversations have been so important, actually, in our um, in our research in terms of helping us to gather memories from from adult perspectives. Um, but it's been really interesting those conversations between adult and adults and children in those settings because as well as reinforcing change over time, um, it, it's also brought out um, kind of perspectives on, on continuities over time. So it's sort of also kind of led to, you know, adults reflection on themes that, that are similar. So, you know, you know, we talked to you about not, not wanting you to spend too much time on, on your phone. Well, actually, you know, that was a kind of core discussion in, in, in the family household when, you know, myself and, and my sibling were, spent, were, were seen as spending too much time on the landline. So it, it's quite interesting how these kind of obsolete technologies, you know, might, might be used to kind of speak to current day topics um, and themes as well in, in this context we found. That's so interesting. That's making me feel quite guilty about the um, the pain I give my daughter for spending too long on her smartphone when the cordless phone arrived just with my teenagers. And I used to be in a lot of trouble for disappearing with the cordless phone for a long time. David, <laughs> do you want to come in on any of the, the threads that we're thinking about right now? Yeah, just it's kind of to that uh, kind of initial question about old technologies and kind of the passing of them. I mean, within, our, within the mass observation responses, um, certainly from the early 90s, as um, word processors and computers start to come in, there's a real kind of emotional uh, response of kind of grief about the loss of the typewriter, um, which I think in some ways speaks to perhaps the middle class um, focus of the panel. There's this sense that the aesthetic of the typewriter, the experience of the typewriter is something that kind of will be lost. Um, but also, that, again, the, the process behind writing, the craft of being able to write typewriter, a skill which has often been developed um, over many years, is something which a number of the respondents, um, and again, it might speak to the particular age constituency of, of the respondents, but a number of them seem very reluctant to kind of lose that. So as well as this new technology coming in, there, there's a real sense of grappling with the loss of an old technology and this kind of resistance to um, bring in something new. I'm so glad you've highlighted that, David. That seems like a really important, important counterfoil to this. I'm thinking about grief, loss, anxiety about the loss of kind of craft or skill or process or ability. Um, I, I, I've noticed, you will, will all have noticed kind of periodically in the media anxiety that, you know, our brains are shrinking because we can just Google everything we need. And as someone who's trained as a medievalist, there's such a parallel there with anxieties in the early medieval period around the fact that if you're writing everything down, you know, with literacy, you won't need to remember. It's so interesting, isn't it? Um, well, you know, uh, those parallels across across millennia. Um, there's, there's loads more I want to follow up in your answers, but we've got some really great um, conversation and questions going on in the chat already. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to dip into that first and then go out to the Padlet and we'll just kind of dip around. So there's some conversation that's just unfolding quite organically in the chat. So if you don't have the chat box open, please do, because some of this is just playing out um, in real time in the chat. But I want to go to the first question there, which is from Chris Lewis. Um, Chris, do you want to ask your question on camera? Um, if you do, um, switch your camera on and, and make yourself known to us. Otherwise, I will read it out um, from the chat. So I'll just give you a moment if you would like to come on and ask that. 
So this is a great question about the sounds of new technology. So Chris asks for what, what can we say about the sounds of new technology for computers? Chris is thinking about the difference between home, um, the sound of a dial up connection and office, the clatter of the Institute of Historical Research's first golf ball printers. Oh, these are so evocative. Um, but also he's prompted to add what must have been the amazing sound of a flushing, flushing loo when it was first heard. So what about these kind of soundscapes um, of new technology? I think all of our speakers could reflect on that. David, can I go straight back to you? Is, is there something you want to pick up there? Yeah, I, I think um, I think that's something, again, the observers do pick up on. Um, the big beige box is how it's described at the time. And obviously computers then are materially something very different. And with that, they are beeping and making noise and dial up internet as, as kind of Chris picks up on is particularly noisy. What we found slightly surprising, there was some there were some people complaining about the noise and kind of its intrusion into the home and kind of the kind of noise pollution of it. There was also some responses a little bit later. And in some ways it's, it reminds me of kind of kind of people who like kind of noisy cars, but people that were impressed by the kind of technological vigor of having a noisy object in the house. So wanted a computer that had flashing lights and beeps and made noises and kind of, you know, it was sensorially um, exciting. So, um, so kind of again, kind of quite diverse responses to um, to kind of the sensory experience of engaging with, with with new computers. You've just made me think of one of the first computers that was on my radar as a child, which wasn't really a computer, which was the computer on chocker block on children's TV, which did exactly that with all the flashing lights and noises. I'm showing my age now. Anyone else want to come in on that question on on soundscapes of new technology? Helen, do you want to jump in on that? Um, I'd just say that if ever I share a picture uh, of a tr the trim phone that I showed on my slides, <laughs> people compiling in with the, it has a, the, that sensory response is always so much more powerful everyone wants to talk about whether they loved it or hated it <laughs> oh that's fascinating it kind of intersects with what Eve was saying about the power of the object as well doesn't it it's the kind of that multi-sensory experience of the technology Eve or Louis do you want to add anything to this I mean, you know, ringtones evolve, obviously, in terms of telephones, and there's that really interesting discussion about, you know, how those in, in kind of a later area can be personalised. But I suppose also the kind of um, the interrelationship with other technologies. So in, in my era, the sort of popularity, the growing popularity of the answer phone. So, so the way in which the kind of soundscape around, around phone use is kind of it is personalising, actually, uh, in quite interesting ways in relation to the answer phone message, um, etc. Um, yeah. Fascinating. You know, I just wanted to add quickly uh, to, to what David was saying. Uh, I, I saw an article um, a few days ago. Someone has uh, invented a gadget that replicates the sound of a, a hard drive clicking for, for, for modern PCs that just have solid state drives. So I, th I think that demonstrates the the importance of sound and the kind of, kind of nostalgia of sound uh, in yeah, to, to everyday people. That's really interesting. That intersects with another question that we have in the, the chat, which I might have just lost, but somebody was asking a question about how new technology sometimes refer back. This is from Stephen. New technology sometimes refer back to older technologies. So um, superseded technologies living on in current iconography. For example, Stephen says WhatsApp uses an analog phone handset as its logo. Um, can you think of any other instances where more recent technologies kind of make references to earlier generations of technologies. I mean, what you've just described is quite a good example in a way, Louis. It's kind of drawing on something that isn't necessary anymore, but has a kind of valency that we have an emotional investment in and in, in, in some ways. Does anyone else want to to reflect on that? Oh, so Rebecca in the chat has talked about the save icon being a floppy disk, which of course would mean nothing, would it? My kids would have no idea what a floppy disk um, was. Yeah, I, I was just about to say the same thing. Um, and also, uh, like the, the speed camera sign being like a uh, early 1900s pull out camera, um, it, I think uh, potentially that could be updated for modern um, audiences. It's a really great example. We've got some lovely other comments in the chat around. Rebecca's also commented on the soundscape, the hum of the fridge, how you notice that um, when it stops. There's lots of um, really great um, chatting going on. Um, 
in here use of the use of sound Sue Bailey is working on the use of sound as a measure of producing food which is really really interesting we're going to come back to some of these threads and questions in the chat there's more that I want to pick up and I do apologize to anyone if I if I miss your comment or your question there's a lot coming through and it's it's quite hard to, to capture everything but I know that everyone who's here is enjoying being involved in that chat and is reading the content as it comes in I'd like to take an opportunity to dive into the Padlet for a moment and then come back into our questions in the room because there's so much wonderful content on the Padlet I'd like to use um, alongside the discussion that's been prompted by our speakers. So can you all see um, my screen that I'm sharing? So we're looking at the Padlet right now. Actually, I'll just see if I can refresh it because um, last time I refreshed it, it had new content that had arrived even during our session. So um, if you're on your own PC, you might want to open the Padlet in a in a window alongside Zoom yourselves and have a little browse um, through. And I wondered if um, the panelists would like to join me in kind of picking out anything that really stands out um, to you um, here in the Padlet. I mean, we've, we've definitely got a real cluster um, of submissions around phones. Um, Eve, and I think probably what you've spoken about has has prompted a lot of that. Um, I still miss my beautiful Nokia from the early 2000s. The ringtone was Cherry Lips by Garbage. Well, that is a that is a moment uh, frozen in time, isn't it? Um, we've also got quite a lot of um, uh, stories here around the kind of domestic labour saving devices that I think, um, in, Helen, you had that wonderful image from the Ladybird book, that kind of picture showing as many as you could kind of count and, and, and spot. So we've got a, a Kenwood mixer. Um, I think we've got um, posts about vacuum cleaners, um, kitchen blenders, other kitchen blenders, washing machines. There's quite a lot here. Um, I wonder if anyone wanted to, to comment, perhaps, thinking about those domestic um, labour saving devices in, in particular, we, we've touched on issues around gender in quite a few of your talks. Um, interestingly, in David's, actually, I, I, I like the way that, that, that we touched on them, but, but lots of your talks have touched on gender implicitly, if not explicitly. I wonder if that's something we could open out to across all of your projects. Um, you know, some of these new technologies in the home are often, you know, often the narrative is structure, structured around gendered experiences and changes to, to gendered roles. Um, but all of these technologies will have, the experience of these new technologies would have been inflected differently according to gender, as well as other kinds of social roles and identities. I wondered if any of you might want to comment on that, um, touch on any of the examples in the Padlet if you want to, or just, just share your thoughts. I would Helen. just say that the, uh, the um, Kenwood Mixer one, yeah, it's, it's, oh, it's yeah. Right at the heart of the domestic yeah. scenes in Ladybird books. Um, and uh, yeah, mum being delighted with any labour saving device, that was such a big theme in the background of so many of the books, always the background because the, the, yeah. the, it was all about the children. But uh, another thing that though, moving on from that, that I, I, I noticed is that uh, in the 1970s Ladybird books about the computer, uh, it's very female dominated. So, um, yeah, let's just say oh, that comes across pictorially. That's really, really interesting. And do you think that was a, a deliberate kind of political statement? No, 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 I don't. I think it, it, it reflected the initially viewing as the Ladybird book of the computer says, uh, Ladybird books are basically big. Uh, big calculators or big typewriters. Um, so it was much more of an extension perhaps of the typing pool, but it did mean that so many of the people who were advancing the uses of the computer in the early days were women, and that's visually represented in the books. Oh, that's wonderful. Really, really interesting. And yeah, I can certainly picture those kind of ladybird scenes with the, the technologies in the background. I'm thinking of kind of hoovers, cookers, mixers. And of course, Helen, you know, the, the charge is often levelled, I mean, I suppose with some justification at the earlier Ladybird books that the roles are quite gendered, that Peter will be out there helping, you know, Peter and Jane books are one tiny part of Ladybird books, of course, but in those reading scheme books, Peter will be out there helping daddy with the car. Um, well, that's a completely might... different, different discussion. I'd say it's to level it particularly at Ladybird books. No, I let Ladybird no. books represented it. They didn't yeah. create it. They reflected yeah. it. Um, yeah. There's no more, there's less. I mean, if you look at the junior science books, Douglas Keane, the commissioning editor, was very, very keen that boys and girls should be pictured as absolutely equal 
participants in all the science experiments, for example. I think in many ways they were ahead of the game, but for reasons I've mentioned before, they often got targeted. Yeah, and so as you said, there's that, that, that tension between kind of documenting the realities of domestic life, reflecting, but then- yeah. Yeah, reflecting them. But then what you're saying about um, in, those, in those factual books being really quite pathbreaking in terms of showing women's roles. But yeah, really interesting thinking about computers as kind of upgraded uh, typewriters and, and, you know, understanding their, their, their function. Thank you, Helen. Anything else um, that anyone wants to say about um, gendered experiences of technology or anything here on the Padlet that you want to kind of dip um, into? Uh, Louis? Yeah, I just wanted to, to jump in on, on that last point. Um, but uh, I, well, we have a, a, a gallery looking at, at domestic lab, labor and a lot of the technology that, that's um, influenced it throughout the centuries. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that all, all these devices that are promised to, to save us time and save us effort, uh, they, they are also a double-edged sword in, in that they increase our, our standards of, of cleanliness um, and uh, of, of how a home should be kept. So uh, it, it, it isn't this clear linear progression uh, of, um, of, yeah, of, of, of saving labor and, and saving time. Um, and we, we also have uh, in that gallery uh, some fan fantastic uh, posters uh, by this uh, female art collective called Sea Red. Um, from the, they were active mainly in, in the 1970s. Um, and they, they talk about the, the inequality of, of domestic labor uh, and they do they they parody uh, a Peter and Jane book as well, um, which is uh, one of our most uh, popular objects, I think. Fantastic, yes, it's kind of like a, a genre in its own right, isn't it? These days, um, parodies of, of Peter and Jane books. Um, uh, Eve or, or David, do you want to come in on on this at all? Eve, it, it's not a, a telephone story, but um, a story I absolutely love on the Padlet is um, is the the short extract from the London Diary of Anthony Heap. Um, from uh, 1941, I think it is. Now, and where, it's a very, can I get it up on the screen? It, where, it should where be, but I think it? it's one of the earlier ones, actually. So you might need to keep scrolling down right a bit. Down at the bottom. Um, um, but it's very, very fun. And it's talking about the wireless radio um, in the home of uh, here Anthony we are. It's, Heap. And, it's over on the right hand side of the screen here. So it's yes. slightly hidden, perhaps, yeah. for some of you. Yeah. Um, no, this is this is such a, a fascinating, I think, short reflection from um, Anthony Heap's diary about, you know, getting, um, I think, a range of sort of wireless radios that, that they're getting um, in, in the marital household. But the marital relationship kind of really comes through here in terms of actually what happens when the wireless radio goes wrong. Um, and the kind of frustration around, you know, this tech, this sort of new technology going wrong and people perhaps not knowing quite what to do with it. And it's very interesting how uh, Marjorie's role uh, here seems to be the kind of the kind of can do woman sort of trying to get this going and trying to kind of fix it. You know, Anthony's kind of recording, uh, recording this example. So it's a really interesting, I think, reflection on a sort of marital relationship on, on a new technology that might be confounding people at home. Yeah, yeah, I love the way we saw that reflected in um, some of the examples you shared, David, I love that example of the debate about whether whether to have a computer in the home and the husband being unsure that there, 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 there would be space for it. I mean, that seems to me, it resonates with what you've spoken about, Louis. It's a whole reimagining of what our domestic spaces can look like, isn't it? You know, where you might have had a sort of vase or a lamp on a side table having a computer. It's such a radical change, um, isn't it? Um, David, is there anything you want to kind of pull out from, from what we've been discussing? Um, well, on that last point, there became increasing, um, well, increasingly the mass observers were interested in discussing um, where, the, where the location of the computer within the home. And um, it's really interesting that the class politics of the home study becomes something that throughout the 90s becomes a, a real, um, a kind of a real, really uh, conspicuous in the uh, responses to mass observation. Those that do, those that don't, those that want a study, those that think that study is itself a kind of a sign of bourgeois indulgence and therefore you know everything that's wrong with the world uh, bringing literally work into the home being something that people resist um, I think I've spoken before with Louis about whether the museum would be interested in doing kind of a home study as a um, as a period room but in many ways it is perhaps the the room of the post-pandemic era really and obviously that study takes many forms for me it's my bedroom um, but for a lot of people it's a dedicated space so I think I wonder you know if that might be a future um, avenue um, to look at for the museum 
Um, in terms of, I, I, just what struck me again in kind of the, the, going down memory lane thing was again that image um, of the Nokia was it seventy two sixty, and um, what struck me about it is how it, it's the image of it as well. I've seen on my this will show my age. I'm still on Facebook, um, and uh, on my Facebook as, as my generation who kind of were children of the nineties, they seem to be sharing a lot of if you were born if you were a kid in the nineties, you would have recognised this. And it's a lot of images of brick mobile phones, of Nokia 3220s, um, a lot of mentions of Snake. Um, and that seems to be peppering my um, my timeline. And I'm just interested in the aesthetic of it. Interestingly, when I did my presentation, I had a couple of images, apologies about the Alan Sugar image. Um, we had a few images, but not many images at all. And that's because when me and James have done other presentations, we're under, with every slide, we had an image of an old computer, an Amiga or one of these and in some ways i think the aesthetic of it it did a lot of intellectual work but in some ways it distracted from the textual analysis we were doing because the images are so redolent they're so um saturated in nostalgia that people end up going down a trip down memory lane on that image alone and i find myself doing that with that particular image as well so i think there's something there about how we represent our histories of these technologies and the use and even not misuse but the kind of both the challenges of visually showing these technologies and how much work that does in itself just showing a phone and how yeah. that immediately is sending you somewhere yeah. absolutely i mean this could be an entirely different this could be a whole session couldn't it about the history of design of these new technologies which we're touching on we're intersecting with of course because we, we can't not um and it's it's part of this discussion but a huge huge area in it in itself um sue bailey i can see has just dropped into the chat a response to some of what's being said about um domestic electrical appliances and gendered roles um reminding us that um it used to be men that had training sessions on how to use the electric carving knife in the early 1970s i should think i remember that the electric carving knife in particular being a very masculine um domestic um electric appliance it was it was often a a, a male family member who would come and use um that kind of tool is there anything else that we want to pick out from the padlet um, we might go back into the room, but we can dip in and out of the Padlet. I mean, there's such a variety of things here. The ID chip operated cat flap that you can you can uh, set up tweets whenever your cat uses the door. Um, who knew? Um, uh, just a really great um, variety um, of materials here so I, I encourage everyone to keep um, looking at those um, I'm going to pick up some more questions um, from the chat and remember also that if you're here in the room and you're not a panelist as well as asking a question or making a comment and it's lovely to see that just playing out organically in the sidebar as we speak um, if you have your own everyday technology first that you want to speak about whether it's an item from your archive or collection or whether it's a, a story or memory that our discussion today has prompted and um, please do raise your hand or drop into the chat you can either just put it in writing in the chat or we can come to you um, for you to to speak um there's a question in the um chat from um or comment in the chat which i think we could respond to from maureen um who says that an aspect of looking at new technologies and progress is also exploring how some communities were adversely affected um, such as in the example she's thinking about artists. The Padlet includes an entry of an early printed Quran. Um, hopefully some of you caught sight of that um, from the Institute of Ismaili Studies and its impact on calligraphers and scribes who created manuscripts whose livelihoods would have been affected by printing. And that's a that's a particular kind of way of thinking about loss, isn't it? The impact on, um, I suppose, you know, this is something that, um, uh, that I think uh, David, you touched on loss and anxieties around loss of skill, loss of capacity, um, loss of loss of craftsmanship. Um, Maureen, you have your hand up. Do you want to kind of expand on on that? You can just unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Maureen. Yes, hi, thank, thank you for taking my question. I'm sorry I don't have the video on due to the internet bandwidth. That's okay. Um, but one thing, yeah, so I find the point of loss really interesting. And, you know, when we think about progress, uh, which is important in terms of the Quran, um, what was really interesting to me when I was looking at it is, you know, there's one aspect of progress, you know, you can disseminate the text 
any printed text in more ways than a handwritten book. But also it's important to see what is not what you cannot transfer by printing. So in this case, you know, the artistry that goes into illuminating texts um, or, you know, calligraphy that, you know, for that to be transferred into printing, some of it is possible, some of it is not. So along with people's livelihoods, there is an art that's being lost as well. Um, but, it's, yeah. you know, so the, the conversation around technology is always really interesting when you look at all these things. And that's a really good point, Maureen, and that kind of intersects with what we were saying about loss, but it, it also points to something else, doesn't it? Kind of what is beyond the capture of technology, what kind of exceeds perhaps what we can be reproduced through technological means, the limitations of new technologies, what falls beyond their scope, which is something I'm going to um, enjoy reflecting mm -hmm. on. Um, any of our panellists want to respond I was, I was to that? Just respond to that very point, which is absolutely to the heart of what I research, which is the artists who created Ladybird books and the post-war richness of these amazingly skilled uh, commercial artists um, who, who uh, attained this height of a, and then with the digital age, these skills were suddenly not, so no longer required. So even when books want to do sort of parodies these days of the Ladybird book style, it's very, very hard to find mm -hmm. that honed technique and ability. And also people asked why Ladybird was so slow to use photographs rather than, you know, figurative images. Mm. Um, when they did, it, it, the, the, the transfer of information was so much was lost because of the, the skills of the artist to really do, do a picture of, you know, a scene and make salient pictures, which especially with the photography of the day it simply wasn't possible to reproduce so much was lost the warmth the engagement you know it might be a, a, a beautiful illustration of a telephone but it was somehow for a child the most warm cuddly telephone you'd you know you'd ever had and, and that cannot be done or could not be done anyway with the photograph you're right those images are animated in a different it's hard to kind of crystallize exactly what that is but they're animated with a, a different kind of um yeah. vibrancy in Those a way skills. aren't they yeah the logic said have been lost I'm certainly thinking back to my own childhood reading those beautiful compositions in the An Our Land in the Making um, books, which probably have got a lot to ans answer for in terms of me ending up um, as a historian um, today. Um, thank you so much for your comments, Maureen. Um, that was really great. Again, I'm just um, inviting anyone who wants to um, bring our attention to anything they've shared on the Padlet or share um, any everyday technology first of their own to join the conversation. There's an interesting question from Jay in the chat, um, which period was a key turning point for each of the panelists' subject areas? And perhaps we could kind of expand that a bit further. So you, you could either answer Jay's question, or I'll be a bit cheeky, Jay, I hope you don't mind, and add a little bit of a one of my own alongside, which is, um, you know, perhaps you could tell us about, is there a particular historical moment, a particular period that you find most interesting in terms of the kind of change that's going on in terms of technology and the social history around those changing technologies. I mean, Louis, you've given us the biggest expanse of historical periods so far today from the 17th century wooden pipe through to Ikea flat pack furniture. Is it unfair of me to, to jump on you and ask if you have a personal favourite historical moment or the one that you consider a real turning point in terms of um, technological innovation? Yeah, that, that, that is, it's very difficult because, um, yeah, I, I kind of, uh, I have to be uh, as broad as possible um, in, in, my, in my outlook. You're um, not allowed to have favourites, is that I'm what you're not, saying no. to us, Louis? You can't, you can't admit to that. No. Um, <laughs> well, and yeah, it's just, just between us in the room, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very difficult trying to pick out uh, 15 or so objects from the past 400 years uh, to look at uh, uh, domestic game changers. Um, but I think uh, what really interests me um, is um, these changes that were happening in, in the 20th century uh, and uh, these similar uh, senses of, of loss and, and anxiety about, uh, about how technology uh, is going to change home life. Um, so we see, uh, and it's, it's centered around uh, the living room, so we, we see anxiety um, when central heating begins to, to replace uh, the fireplace, um, that 
this could lead to a breakup of the family because there's now no longer any reason to all gather together. Um, we can just all live our lives in, in separate rooms in the home. And then uh, similarly, uh, now with with kind of the uh, with then television sort of took the place of of the fireplace um, as that hub for family life. And now, or at least uh, in the last ten years, we're seeing the, the anxiety back again of oh no no one's watching TV anymore. There's there's no such thing as kind of a an appointment uh, TV program, um, and we're all just on our different devices. Um, so I, I think uh, it's it's just ha yeah having that broader outlook. It's just fun to see uh, the the same concerns happen uh, again and again with with new technologies. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Louis. Can I just reach out um, quickly um, in the chat to Chris Derrick? Chris, are you are you in the room? You, you've made a really interesting comment um, in the chat about your first experience with digital computers when you were an undergrad at, at Durham um, in 1967. The com computer was an Elliott. 803 8k now this doesn't mean very much to me i'm afraid chris i wondered if you, <laughs> you you're with us fantastic do you want to speak about that because that's a great everyday technology first memory and then you have a question as well are you happy to speak on camera about that yeah of course can you hear me yes we can thanks yeah. um yeah when i was a physics undergraduate at durham um the university computer that was the, the, the main computer was an elliot 803 i think it was an 8k um computer and as an undergraduate, we were allowed to book the computer for the whole night to go and practice our our uh, programs, and they were pr programmed in a language called Algol, uh, which was um, you had to type the um, program on paper tape. Uh, you took your paper tape to the computer, put it in, and it ran through a compiler and produced another paper tape, which was the compiled version, which you then ran through the computer as the program. Um, and just, that just sort of gives you an idea of how primitive it was uh, and how little computing resources universities had in those days. Um, but what it what intrigues me is really is what happened to all those those programs that people wrote, um, because um, I don't know of any archive uh, where they were, where they are kept. They may well have been kept, but there may be something to be learned from them. They may be just too too primitive uh, for any use, but um, I think it's, um, I mean, I don't know whether anybody in the room actually has programmed in our goal, but it was a really, a really neat language and it's completely disappeared now. Those Thanks. are really interesting uh, comments, Chris, and, and, and if anyone can answer those questions in the room, please drop them into the chat. I suspect, Chris, that David Geiringer might have had some answers to your question, We've slightly mistimed this, or his colleague James Baker that he referred to, who had worked with at Sussex, who I think is now a colleague of, of Eves at Southampton, where he's Director of Digital Humanities, who will who will know about kind of archiving um, efforts with these, these early kind of programming um, languages um you've been far too generous and gracious chris to say so the rest of us don't know we're born and don't know how lucky we are compared with the kind of technology you have you have to work on i can't resist asking you though did did you go on to work with computers beyond your your student time have they been a big part of your life yeah, i am um, i actually um was involved in buying a computer for the mrc the medical research council and this was a a hewlett packard 2116 computer in the um it was in the uh, uh, 70s and that occupied the entire room and that was 16k <laughs> I mean, and it was it was a similar kind of thing where you had to compile the, the thing but it used basic then so some i think basic probably is a, a language that more people here will be familiar with yes. but that was again um you know moore's law really came into its um you know it was that was a a, a multi thousand pound computer uh, for doing what um, you, you probably do with your mobile phone these days. Yeah. And I'm thinking about the picture that I shared on the Padlet of my sister playing our BBC microcomputer, and we got that game by collecting coupons on Weetabix boxes. Um, and that was what, like 1983 or 1984? So that really gives a sense of how rapidly that revolution had occurred, that ordinary families sitting at the breakfast table could be kind of cutting out their, their coupons and, and accessing accessing this it was it was in enough people's homes that it made sense of people um chris i can see that uh, my colleague kate has dropped in a, a link 